Career Pathways panel discussion. Um, this is going to be about career and other opportunities for those of you who are studying languages and different cultures. Um, we've got three panelists. Um, someone was out, is out six, so I'm just going to relay some specific points that I've gleaned from previous presentations. Um, Kali Fagerhofer, um, Michelle Gonzalez, and Kelly Nelson. Um, basically, the structure will be they'll give a short presentation, five, ten minutes, um, talking about their area of expertise. And then um, we'll have some QA along the way. Um, towards the end, I want to present some information pulling from the Career Center and more specific strategies about how you might start your job search process or reflecting on thinking about what you might want to do next. Um, I hope you've all signed in outside. There's some handouts and there's some blank index cards along the way. Um, that's something that we might be using if we have time just to do something a little bit more interactive at the end. Okay. Um, oh, and I am Clara Kawanishi. I'm an LSA academic advisor and I'm in an LSA advising center. Um, so thank you very much for showing up. Um, we're thinking that maybe um, you'll all be out of here at the latest by 7.30. All right, so let's start off with Dr. Federhofer. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Kali Federhofer, and I teach in the German department, and I have to teach at 7 o'clock tonight, so um, I have to leave a little bit earlier. And um, I'm also an advisor for German majors and minors, and I've been advising here at the university for about 13 years. And one of my questions, um, coming also from Germany here to the US was certainly, okay, why should anybody major in German? Um, what are you doing with it? And so when I ask students about this, um, they generally said, okay, you can become a teacher. And at that time, the internet wasn't particularly popular. Then some people said, oh, you can become a translator. And this is where it ended. And so you are now in a position where you may also say, okay, I want to major in a foreign language. Who wants to major in German? Excellent. <laughs> After this session, you all will major in German. No, I mean, but many of you, I think, are probably in Romance languages or in some in Asian language, maybe. Um, and you get from all your friends who are pre-business, pre-law, who are in engineering, they already seem to have carved their careers. And so when I came here and thought, okay, I do advising, but I'm interested in what are these students doing with a language degree? And how does it help them or does it help them at all? And I was actually quite surprised to find that few of our students um, use German as their primary location after they graduate. So we have few students who go afterwards to Germany to work there. We have some, but um, the majority of the students stay here in the US and they may do even something that is not related at all to their undergraduate major. So don't think that when you major in one subject, oh, now you're carved into this. And you have to go for the rest of your life pursuing something that is related to Spanish or to Japanese. And so I made here a little sample, um, a survey of our students. Okay, what did they actually do as undergraduates? Um, what did they study? And you see here undergraduate majors in we have a number of students here at Michigan who are double majors, and I think it's easier in foreign languages to double major than it may be in natural sciences. If you're a biochem major or um, 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 microbiology major, it may be more difficult to double major in there, but I think foreign languages generally make it easier to, um, to double major. And this is also what we see in our department where we have about 70% of our students who double major in um, within a, a, a different subject. So you see here, and this is just a sample of what our students have done, okay? A student in German political science was always interested, I want to write a screenplay. Um, this is not what you think of a student, you know, with German political science, but her idea was, okay, I have to go to Hollywood, I have to go to Los Angeles after this, and I want to write a screenplay. And lo and behold, um, last, um, last, when was that, October, she, one of her screenplays, and it was for Family Guy, does anybody know Family Guy? So she had written that screenplay for it, and she had also before written one for 90210, 501, I don't know, 90210, I think. Um, so 
the cheapest suit, what she was interested in. This is the first advice I mean that I have for all of you. Su study something that you're passionate about. Don't think, oh, you know, because my parents are engineers, my parents are um, doctors, I have to go to the medical field. If you're passionate about something, this is where you go, and this is what you should be doing. But then when you look at other things, Fields here. Okay, you have German business. Um, it's possible here to get a dual degree, bank one. Okay, this makes sense. Yeah, business school in banking, banking. But then suddenly you find a student with German history who is working in the bank. So it's not necessarily the kinds of classes that this student had been taking, but it's the entire profile. Don't think, oh, I have to take this particular Spanish class, this particular class in policy, because that will lead me directly into this career. It's the whole individual that's important here. And I think many of you are interested in studying abroad, doing an internship abroad. Use these facilities that you know the International um, Center here offers and go abroad because this enriches, I think, your overall profile. And this is what makes you marketable instead of one single class. And mind also, I don't write anything here about GPAs. Don't think here, oh, these are only students who had a GPA of 3.8 or higher. There are students, enough students, whose GPA was not so high. Um, and I see a lot of consulting companies, and then um, when we, oh, sorry, bro. Um, when we have, for instance, somebody in German and English, so two humanities subjects, okay, but still became an event planner for Porsche. Um, and this is a person, and quite a number of people here, you know, they make connections. Try to make connections while you are um, while you're an undergraduate. Is anybody a graduating senior here? Okay. You know, it's, you can go to, I think some departments have LinkedIn pages. Use also your classmates as a resource. Um, but make connections to people here. I think more and more with these social media that we are relying on, you will suddenly see what peers have done, what somebody a year or two years ahead of you have done with a degree, and um, this person can also serve as a valuable resource. What else is out there? Um, I just talked to Kelly because we normally sit on Fulbright um, um, interview committees. You can become a high school teaching assistant for English for a year. Um, and they have these ETAs, so-called English teaching assistantship positions, out in Germany, in Austria, we have students that I interviewed who wanted to go to Luxembourg, so somebody who's in, interested in French um, could do this. And you don't, none of these students here actually was a student in the School of Education. And so they like actually also taking students, I'm sure, and I've seen actually students who didn't even study German, but they were still able to go to Germany for a year, get paid, being a teaching assistant for English. This goes through the International Institute. And the deadline, um, unfortunately, for next year already passed. But that's for juniors. Um, certainly, still something that you can um, that you can go to. Getting a teaching certificate, maybe. Maybe you're interested in teaching. Um, and we had then a number of students who came out after this teaching assistantship abroad, and they pursued, for instance, a Master of Arts degree with certification here at the University of Michigan, and they can teach now in a public school here um, in. Um, almost every state in the US. What I also find interesting, because we have a lot of students for German who are not continuing with their German graduate studies, and you see here we have graduate level PhD programs in German. Uh, in, in America, sorry, but this is what the student is doing the PhD in. So history, history, public health, mathematics, chemical engineering, chemistry, philosophy. If you only look at these left schools here, Penn, Emory, Harvard, MIT, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, Princeton, you know, these are very, very competitive universities. You come from a competitive university here, but you have the resources and they want you actually, even with a, um, with a foreign language degree, in these years, and I will say something later on about medical schools, why this may be the case, but it's a very, I think, impressive list. And this is just a sample, and I didn't say that, oh, I need to pick up the best, um, student at Iowa who's doing film, um, which is a great place, and um, again you see um, various places where they had German plus something else, and this is where they do their um, graduate studies in. 
We have, of course, also a lot of students who are interested here in the medical field. I mean, you see, I'm sure a lot of you may also even have this kind of interest. What I did here is I just listed this alphabetically by universities. And if you look here at the University of Michigan, so they have here in the medical school somebody who had a major in German comparative literature, somebody with a German economics major, somebody with a German mark. Mark, I must admit, doesn't exist any longer. This is medieval and Renaissance collegiate. Um, so basically classical studies. And I asked somebody, I ran to somebody on the admissions board, and they said, look, we are not looking for these people who are monochrome. We want students who excel in something else. And this is also what these graduate programs are like. And these two students, for instance, German complete and German economics, they were in the same medical school class here. They studied abroad in Germany during their junior year. At that time, it was always the junior year abroad. And they realized, hey, we want to do something with um, in the field of medicine. So she had taken all her pre-med classes, or she took all her pre-med classes um, in her senior year. This student finished his econ honors degree and his German degree, and then as a non-degree student took um, only his, um, his pre-med classes and was accepted here for the MD MBA program. And so they are both now married, isn't that nice? And um, they are in San Francisco, and he actually does hospital administration um, in San Francisco. But again, you know, very, I think, um, it's not that you need, even here at Michigan, just German majors, in the, and they are here regular um, med school students. The same is with law schools. I mean, we have a lot of students here also who want to go to law school, and here somebody, German, and, Arabic language, AAPTI, I always forget what this stands for. Um, <laughs> okay, there seem to be a lot of languages involved in this. And um, this is a student now who is um, starting his second year at Berkeley. And um, again, you will see a number of um, also students, certainly from Michigan, German economics, German history, um, who became then law school students um, here. And then you can also become a nose tackle in Indianapolis if you um, make this. But so there are lots of um, options for you. And don't think here, OK, one, if I'm one major in one language, um, what can I do with it? These students, there are lots of um, fields also that I haven't actually touched on. Um, uh, um, interesting careers, very interesting careers that some are taking. And we want now. Because we, you will get eventually an exit survey, and we ask our students, do you make this information publicly available for future students? So you see actually the names of students who just graduated in 2013, and they all said yes. Pass on my name to anybody who has an interest. What I'm doing now is for our German majors and minors, we have a C tool site, and org studies I know has something similar to this, where our German majors can see, okay, what did somebody who graduated, and at the moment I have only posted those for 2013, um, of whom I have the information, what is their background? So you see somebody in the Ross School of Business with a German mind, a German in neuroscience, um, German political science. So this is then for our current students to search and say, okay, does anybody do my combination? Let's see somebody German and English, for instance, here. So what is this student doing now? And you see here, Okay, this is a person who goes to graduate school in, for instance, German, and this was a student with German um, BCN plus a minor in anthropology is now at the School of Public Health. Um, or somebody at the um, this University of Tennessee does law school. And the idea is that somebody else who maybe in a year or two is also accepted or applying to the University of Tennessee Law School can then get in contact with this person because we also post this um, the contact information here of the student, the email on there. And I think a lot of departments are going this route now that they make this kind of information accessible to the undergrads. So ask in your specific department whether they have this, because we collect it in our exit service. And now I think 10 minutes are. Since um, Dr. Fedehofer has to leave a little bit earlier, if there are specific questions that you have for him now, Otherwise, we can move on. Okay, you move on. I stay. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Yeah. Okay.
I'm going to stay sitting. So uh, my name is Michelle. I am a first year graduate student at the Ford School of Public Policy and I'm also a graduate student advisor at the International Center. Um, so I guess what I'm going to talk about is how language and cultural studies played a role in my academic and professional career. So um, I'm originally from Texas. I uh, studied, studied at Brandeis University just outside of Boston and I was a poli-sci in an international and global studies major. Now within the international and global studies major, it's an interdisciplinary major, so my emphasis was on, what was it? So it was cultures, identities, and encounters. So my requirement was that I had to take an extensive amount of, of, of language courses in the language of my choice and I had to study abroad. So that's basically, I, I have a lot of um, Spanish background. That's what I chose to study. Um, I studied abroad in my junior year. I was directly enrolled into some Argentine universities. I went with a program called IFSA Butler. So if you are freshmen, sophomores, if you're looking for a language intensive study abroad opportunities, I would look at Butler University. Um, it's a non-U of M program, but I know the International Center has a lot of information on that program. Um, it was the best thing I could have done because I was basically enrolled in the Argentine universities as an international student. So it was a really interesting experience and I got a lot of, um, I really improved my writing and my reading skills there. I wrote research papers, I had oral exams in Spanish, so it was, it was a great experience. Um, after I graduated, I joined the Peace Corps. I was in Honduras and so Bill and I, Bill works at the International Center, we're talking about how Spanish is actually considered a scarce language because to be placed in a region of the world where they, where they speak Spanish, you have to have some kind of background, like at least intermediate. But I mean, the more extensive language background you have, they'll place you there. It's one of those languages. Um, so when I came back, I worked in local city government. Um, and what's interesting to think about is when people major in languages, they feel like they have to go abroad, right, to, um, I guess, further their studies or to, hone their, their language skills, but um, I found myself using Spanish quite a bit um, where I was working. So I worked at City Hall in San Antonio and I worked for an elected city official. And I worked in a district that was predominantly Latino, that spoke, major the majority of the families there spoke Spanish. So I found myself using Spanish almost on a daily basis when working with constituents. Um, it, it ranged from very mundane things like my neighbor's grass is too high, so I need to call code compliance. But this was, of course, all in Spanish. Or utility assistance, like their lights were going to get cut off and they needed help, um, I guess, trying to keep that on. And, and so it was um, an interesting experience because you don't think that that would necessarily happen. Um, but I feel like as we're becoming more and more diverse, you hear more and more languages in the United States. I feel like there are pockets of the country where you can definitely use a certain a specific language. Um, let's see. Um, I think it's important to study different languages and also cultural studies. I think there's not enough emphasis on cultural studies because it's this idea that like, I, I just feel like uh, cultural studies allows you to study different backgrounds that you're not necessarily exposed to. So I mean, if you're if you are a language major and you're not focusing on some kind of cultural study, I really encourage you to take a class that focuses on that because it is a definitely a good experience to have and it makes you think about things very differently. Um, but that's all I have. So. <laughs> Okay, I guess it's my turn. Uh, my name is Kelly Nelson and I'm an advisor in the International Center's Education Abroad Office. I have been in this role since 2008. Um, in this role, I advise uh, members of the University of Michigan community not only on study abroad programs, but also on work abroad, so internships, volunteering abroad, and postgraduate opportunities. So um, I'm going to talk kind of briefly about my own personal background because I was actually a foreign language major. So um, as an undergraduate, I went to Hope College. I was a psychology and German major. So that's very exciting. Um, as a German major, I did study abroad for one year in Germany. And I have to say, and you probably hear a lot of people say this, but it completely altered the course of my life. Prior to studying abroad in Germany for the year, I was planning on becoming a therapist. And after studying abroad in Germany, um, I learned about a field of, called international education, which I'm currently in. 
and it opened up a whole new career path for me. So instead of going directly to graduate school, which was my plan all along, I decided to apply for the Fulbright grant, which Holly referenced earlier. And I ended up going to Germany for a year after undergraduate, um, went back and I did the teaching assistantship. And I really wanted to do this because I wanted a second chance to improve my German. I'll admit, when I studied abroad, I spoke too much English. And I realized this after I got back. I wasn't quite as happy with my language acquisition. So I wanted a second chance to really immerse myself. And I felt that you know, even though I was teaching English, so I was working in English most of the time, my German improved so much that year because I was speaking German with the other teachers. I was speaking German in the community and with my roommates. So I used my foreign language way more that year than I did during study abroad. And I also wanted um, a second chance at really immersing myself in the German culture again. And, and I was able to do that through working in the school and just learning how the school system works in a country. I'll talk a little bit more about the Fulbright um, a little bit later. So after I returned from the Fulbright, I came to the University of Michigan to pursue a master's in social work degree. And I did that because it's a pretty broad master's degree. I could either become a therapist or I could go into international education. So as you can see, I decided to um, pursue a career in the field of international education, which I'm very happy about. I find it to be a very rewarding career because on a daily basis, I'm helping people pursue um, you know, potentially life-changing opportunities. So that's very exciting. As far as the importance of language and cultural studies in today's world, I mean, I think Holly and um, Michelle outlined it really nicely. Um, I hope that you all grabbed the handout that was on the table called Language as Your Credential of a global, for a Global Career. There are just a couple of points that I want to um, mention from, from this handout, and I know you all can read, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to read a couple of things off for you. But um, uh, the first paragraph says, knowledge of a foreign language is always a plus for international work. It's seen as a basic credential and as evidence for actually being able to work in and work with other cultures. Um, and for fields in which knowledge of a foreign language is necessary, knowledge of a first language really does make, not, make learning a second language easier. So that is a great thing for all of you since you're all learning um, a foreign language here. Also, if you're uh, pursuing a career in international development, international business, global engineering, you're probably going to need a, a degree other than just your foreign language. So Holly kind of already talked about that, whether that's a double major here or even more likely an advanced degree it, from like a professional school or a PhD or something like that. So those are just a couple of the points listed here. And I think Holly actually did a really great job summarizing a lot of what is in this handout. So um, I hope you all grabbed that. As far as specific examples of opportunities, I just want to say a few words about the field of international education because it's one that you might not know much about. Again, I had no idea it even existed until after I studied abroad and then worked in an international office at my undergraduate institution. But I would say that it's really relevant to all of you who are studying foreign languages because I, most people in the field of international education have studied at, at least one foreign language and most of them have lived abroad for some part of their life. So it's probably relevant to a lot of you in this room right now. Um, as a really brief overview, just to let you know what international education is, there are several different fields under the umbrella of international education. The one in which I work is education abroad, so facilitating opportunities for students to go abroad to do study or work. International Student Scholar Services is also a major part of international education, so that would include uh, jobs working with international students and scholars at universities, um, not only helping them with the legal aspects of their time, or, uh, of maintaining legal status in, in the United States, but also helping them uh, you know, adjust to uh, life in the United States. International student recruitment is another part of international education. Uh, some universities need to do a lot of work to recruit international students, so you get to travel all over the place and interact with people from all over the world. And then teaching English as a foreign language is another part of international education. So there actually is a professional association, or actually multiple professional associations within the field of international education, but if you want to learn a little bit more about it, um, a website that I would recommend looking into is um, nafsa.org, so that's N-A-F-S-A dot org. And um, that professional association in particular is kind of the umbrella over all those various fields I was just describing, so you can get an idea of what types of opportunities are out there if that is something that you're thinking about. Most opportunities or most jobs in the field of international education do require a master's degree. Um, it doesn't need to be a master's degree in international education. Those do exist if you want it, but you don't, you don't need it. I have a degree in social work. There are people ha that have degrees in area studies and public policy. 
people go into the field of international education from really all walks of life. It's a really diverse community. It's really fantastic in that way. Um, there will be an International Opportunities Fair at the end of October on October 24th. And the reason I bring this up right now, and I guess I'll talk about it um, in a, a few minutes in a greater um, length, but um, the SIT Graduate Institute will actually be at the International Opportunities Fair. And they not, they not only offer study abroad programs for undergraduates, but the Graduate Institute actually does offer master's degree programs in fields related to international education and peace and social justice studies. So if that sounds interesting um, at all to you, I would definitely recommend attending the fair and talking to the representative. Now as far as global careers more generally, um, most students or recent grads don't get international careers or don't have international careers right off the bat. They're not necessarily working abroad right off the bat. In fact, for many international careers, um, people need at least a couple years of experience. And so I say that for a couple of reasons. Um, Kali already mentioned this, but get as much experience as you can while you're still undergraduates. Um, do internships abroad, study abroad, do as much as you can. Um, and also, it's really important to take into consideration um, the short-term postgraduate opportunities. And I know the focus of this panel is more so on careers, but in order to get the global career, you should really look into um, these postgraduate opportunities. And there are lots of them. Um, one of them is the Fulbright, which we've already talked about a couple of times. But as a general overview, the Fulbright is a program through the US Department of State. And the focus of it is to foster cross-cultural understanding. And there are two main types of Fulbrights for recent graduates. The one is the Study or Research Fulbright. And that is essentially funding um, for you to carry out a self-designed research study for one year or possibly earn um, a one-year master's degree um, from a foreign institution. The other type of Fulbright, which actually seems to be expanding um, at a, a quite a quick rate, is the English teaching assistantship. And that's what I did in Germany. And there are English teaching assistantships all over the world. Um, in fact, you don't even need to know a foreign language in order to apply for some of these programs. Um, but the Fulbright is essentially funding, and um, it allows you to be abroad for um, an academic year, learning a language, learning about a new culture, and also sharing um, your culture with the community that you're in. So it's a really fantastic opportunity. As Kali mentioned, the, the application deadline to apply through the University of Michigan, unfortunately, it did pass. It was really early on September 9th. Every year it's very early. but. Um, you can still apply at large, which means you would not go through the University of Michigan process. And that application deadline is October 15th. It's still coming up very quickly. It, it is a rather lengthy application process. It requires two essays. It requires three letters of recommendation. So if the, if the Fulbright sounds interesting and you really want to apply by October 15th, you would probably want to get started tonight. <laughs> um, and then I, I, I should also mention that um, you don't only have to do the Fulbright right after you graduate. So you could also work for a year, then do the Fulbright. Um, you could get a master's degree, then do the Fulbright. So it's nothing that you necessarily need to do right away. It's a good option for the future as well. Peace Corps, um, Michelle already talked about that, but if you are interested in a career in global development, international development, there's really no better way to prepare for that. And I think if you're able to join us for some of the uh, International Career Pathways discussions that are taking place later this month, um, such as careers in global health. Um, I've attended these sessions uh, for several years now, and it seems like every year the professionals that are talking about their career paths are talking about how they did Peace Corps before they got into the field of global health, or they, they're mentioning that in order to get into this field, you should have um, around two years of experience, and what better way to get the experience than doing a program like Peace Corps, which is 27 months long. So Peace Corps is another example. And the Peace Corps office um, is actually located within the International Center. We have some amazing Peace Corps resources here. We have two returned Peace Corps volunteers um, who work in the office. They're able to advise generally. They can answer any questions that you have about Peace Corps. And then if you do end up applying, uh, they can actually do the interviews and everything right here on campus. So it's very convenient. Uh, they have lots of information sessions and application workshops too. So there are lots of resources to help you explore it. Even if you're just a tiny bit interested, I would really encourage you to come in and, and chat with the advisors. Peace Corps also has a really neat master's international program. So if you're thinking that you want to earn a master's degree and do Peace Corps, you can do that. Uh, you can look at the Peace Corps website to actually get an overview of all the universities in the country that offer Masters International, but right here at the University of Michigan, several of our professional schools have these programs, 
as an example, the school of social work does. So for people who are interested in working with at-risk youth, you can apply for the Peace Corps and for graduate school. You would come to the University of Michigan and do one year of graduate school at the School of Social Work, just to use that as an example. Then you would go do Peace Corps for two years, and then you would come back to the University of Michigan and complete your second year of the Social Work program. So that's a really amazing way to um, have like a, to build in kind of like a comparative study into your uh, graduate program. And there are also like scholarship incentives and things like that too for people who take part in these programs. And then um, teaching English abroad is another really great post-grad opportunity for people looking to gain it one or two years of international experience after graduation. And as Kali mentioned, you do not need to have teaching certification in order to take part in many of these programs. And in our office, we have a packet of information about that, and we have um, a lot of information on our website as well. We're happy to invite, advise you individually. Um, but I think that you can, there are so many skills that you gain from teaching English abroad that you can transfer to literally any field. And as I mentioned before, even though you're teaching English, you're still gonna be using the foreign language when you're out in the community and interacting with other people in the school. So it's still really important. Um, I already referenced the upcoming International Career Pathways events, but as we move um, on through the series, a lot of the, the uh, presentations are actually gonna get more career specific. So I already mentioned careers in global health, there is one on um, global careers in engineering, global environmental careers. So there's a whole lot of stuff coming up and I would definitely encourage you to uh, attend these panels. The presenters at these panels are often mid-career professionals, they're very accomplished. And what they do is talk about how they got where they are today. And so they talk about their own career pathway and they give advice to people in the audience. So definitely try to come. We do videotape all these sessions, as you can see, and we put them up on our YouTube site. So um, our, our YouTube handle is mgoabroad, so if you search that in YouTube, we already have like around 25 videos up, some of last year's International Career Pathways sessions, including a couple that we um, have already added this year. So there are resources, um, if you can't make those sessions, you can certainly watch them online. Um, and then the International Opportunities Fair, which is coming up on October 24th, uh, that is a really fantastic fair. It's from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, come as you are, so certainly uh, come in between classes if you can, or if you don't have class, join us for as much time as you want. But that's kind of like a study abroad fair, but all of the organizations there have some sort of work focus. So that might mean working while studying, or doing a volunteer project while studying abroad. It might mean doing an international internship while you're still a student. But there are lots of organizations there that will offer opportunities for graduating seniors as well. And a lot of it will be um, things like teaching English abroad or fellowships. So um, definitely keep that in mind. You're looking into this at a great time because a lot of the more competitive programs actually have really early application deadlines. So it's great that you're all here today. And I think that is about it for me. So. show you a very short clip um, that I think illustrates um, um, just from an alum uh, and you can also find this on YouTube if you want to I was in a high level meeting with the chairman of GD car company, an independent car company in China. He had all of his the car company in China. He had all of his executives there. On my side were all my colleagues from my company. And we're about to start a, a quite a formal meeting. And it's there's tension in the air. Uh, tension the kind that when there's high stakes negotiations or meetings that take place at normal. But it's compounded by the fact that they were all Chinese and we were all Americans and the expectation is how is this meeting going to go forward? Are we going to do it in Chinese or in English? So I decided to take a chance and uh, I jumped into Chinese and I addressed my eyes to the chairman, Chairman Li Shu Fu Jili, straight across the table and I said, I think we've met before, haven't we? That's what it meant, yeah. And then he looked, sat up and looked and kind of smiled, trying to remember. And I said, 
And these are the words that you said to me, Mike. A car needs gasoline and a man needs to drink. And with that, everybody in the room burst into laughter and we we're off and running. Good feeling all around the table, a common understanding, and goodwill. Just a specific example um, where the career field that this graduate is in isn't exclusively using his language skills, but they're it initiated um, a relationship that they, he could have and build off of, and so developing trust. Um, doing complicated and sophisticated negotiations. So here you can leverage those language skills into that. Um, a couple of the things I wanted to add, and this was just sort of picking up some notes from um, what other Asian language and culture majors and minors have done, um, just to give you a few more things in your list of possibilities. Um, what's common, um, I think, uh, probably across a lot of the language studies is um, for students to pair it with something else, to have a combination of that linguistic and cultural background alongside side, some other kind of domain knowledge. Um, within ALC, then this is specific to students who have studied Chinese, um, a Chinese language comedian uh, doing stand-up and also teaching Chinese, um, someone through public policy who did an internship and through that works in earthquake relief um, with an NGO, working for um, the government, so the State Department. Um, so some obvious uh, careers where you want to leverage your language and cultural studies. Um, other government offices, entrepreneurs um, like this alum, working with um, US and Asian car companies. Um, someone who's a consultant in Shanghai and leading conservation historical tours in the city, U.S.-China Business Council teaching at international schools, teaching English in China, um, working at U of M in study abroad programs like Kelly does or in something like the U.M. China Initiative Program, uh, working in international trade, uh, other kinds of NGOs, and in media and broadcasting companies um, in China. So again, some of these are examples where the content knowledge within Chinese or German or Spanish is what is the main content of the career or educational path. But probably just as many, if not more, um, leverage those skills and use that as a way to have a competitive edge or to supplement what they're doing in medical school. Um, so that's just a little bit from the Asian Languages Department. Um, so now, um, I do want to shift gears a little bit and provide you some time to pepper our panelists with questions. Um, and because uh, again, I, I do want to take advantage of the fact that we do have them here. Um, for those of you who can stay um, for, the, for longer than maybe 10, 15 minutes, um, there's some more things online that I want to show you in terms of resources and ways to potentially model the searches that you're doing to look for what to do next. Um, so any questions for our panelists? I've always been worried that if I take a year off to study abroad that it would mess up getting my degree. Have, do a lot of people run into that problem or do you think it's easy enough to transfer credits and do all that? The question is about taking some time to go abroad, whether it's taking a year off or doing the fall and winter semester. Yeah. Are you referring, did you say you're referring to studying abroad as an undergraduate? Yes. Lots of people um, do that. You would just have to speak to your academic advisors about how the credits would transfer. So in fact, there are many University of Michigan sponsored programs that are an academic year long. And then there are non U of M programs too if you can't find one through U of M. But the most important thing would be to talk to people like Clara who are academic advisors who can talk to you about how the credits would fit into your U of M curriculum. But then if you're going through a U of M program, they count as Michigan credits anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so they count towards your regular undergraduate degree. If you're here in LSNA, 120 credits that you need. So they count as if you're taking these credits here. How they now factor into your major or into a minor, there you have to talk then to the specific department. Does that department accept that specific credit? Um, that's hard to answer. I know, I mean, I'm in German and we are fairly generous. Um, so it is very possible to study abroad um, and 
get approval from the department, um, as long as you get the curriculum and the content, the coursework approved by them, to actually fulfill major and minor requirements. You can also do this in non-language and culture programs. So if you're studying overseas and you happen to take a history class there, and you are a history major, um, you might be learning that in German, um, and then you would talk to your history advisor to say, I took this upper level history class, may I use it towards my major requirements? Um, so many programs, you're taking a full load of credits, 12 to 16 credits pretty typically. Um, so it's just a little bit extra planning that you have to do in advance to know what will count, what will be transferable. If you go through a non uvm program and you don't, you can vet this in advance. But if you go without checking and you end up taking um, food and wine tasting in the Italian countryside, most likely that will not transfer. If you took the anthropology of food and culture, taught from an anthropological perspective, that would be an example of a class that you're taking advantage of the site that you're in, but probably would count towards anthropology or your social science distribution. So most likely, I'm studying Russian and I'm a third year student right now. So if I were to travel to Russia, most of my classes would be taught in Russian and I would be studying at a Russian university. Um, they would most likely just be then applied to a Russian major. Or is it possible that if I took like a history class, it could be applied to history? To history or distribution? Yeah, to yeah. distribution. Well, they could just be electives. Maybe you fulfill all your requirements while you're on campus, and you still need 20 to 30 credits to reach that 120 for essay say graduation. So it could just be whatever you want to take advantage of while you're there. Translation and interpretation, those are usually, from my perspective, like more freelance type careers. Are there more like stable careers that are focused on things like that? There are graduate studies that can be done in um, translation, and you may also have heard that we start implementing a translation minor at the university. I don't even know, is it already out there the minor, or has it just been approved? No, I don't think it's out. It's out yeah. um, so there is, for instance, one from the University of Illinois. They offer graduate studies in translation. Um, you can also, I mean, it depends on what kind of translation you want to be doing. Is this literary translation? Um, because what you would find is Monterey Institute of International Studies, but there you would go, for instance, to the UN and you become an interpreter. So somebody is giving a paper and you have to do simultaneous translation, which is a very, very stressful job because I think they change these um, interpreters every 15 minutes because it's so hard to keep up in this space. And you have to stand then also in front of a class, you know, where the instructor talks and you have to translate this to someone else. So this is for very advanced um, interpreting um, degrees. And this is the Monterey Institute of International. And there's one other, because you had asked about translation, I think it's through the University of Rochester. So look at the University of Illinois there. I'm very certain that they have a translation degree in the University of Rochester. certification. So like the Fulbright program and a lot of the other programs that we advise on on a regular basis are looking for people who are native speakers of English who have at least a bachelor's degree and sometimes and often I mean they are looking for people who have relevant experience but that could be things like tutoring or even like leadership responsibilities in the student organization or something like that. You don't necessarily have to have teaching experience. But if you did want to get teaching experience, there are opportunities to um, do so. So there's an English language institute that's affiliated with the University of Michigan, and they have actually a course um, on teaching English as a foreign language. I think it's often held during the spring semester. It might be held during other semesters as well, um, but that could be something to look into. They learn the theory behind it, and then there are also opportunities to actually practice teaching, which is really nice. Um, the English language institute also has um, volunteer opportunities such as the conversation circles 
uh, program where you could volunteer to be a leader of a conversation circle and the circle is comprised of um, people from the Ann Arbor community or the U of M community who want to improve their English. So you could get some experience that way. Um, for people who are speakers of Spanish, there's also a program called Palma, um, which is, I believe, affiliated with the Department of Romance Languages and um, allows you to do some tutoring of um, folks who speak Spanish as their native language. So there are certainly ways to get experience here in Ann Arbor. And then I think the only way to get kind of like the formal training would be through the International, or the English Language Institute. Our neighbor institution, Eastern Michigan University, I believe they have an entire, um, you know, like career or a, a educational track that you could do if you wanted to get like a master's degree in teaching English as a second language. We actually had a student in German who did her undergraduate degree in German and then she went to Eastern, um, got a master's degree in English as a second language and she's now at the University of Tübingen full time, so it's Tübingen is the sister city of Ann Arbor and she is the head of the language education at the university. It's a very reputable, it's one of the top 10 universities in Germany and so um, she basically oversees how essay writing is taught at the University of Tübingen for German students who study English. And some of the programs um, for teaching English abroad actually do have a pretty comprehensive orientation and sometimes they offer um, uh, like a two-week teaching English as a foreign language course that you might take once you get in country. So there are some programs that offer a little bit more training. But in general, if you want to teach English abroad for like a year or two, um, you probably don't need to obtain any sort of formal certification. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Great. On that same question, what would they expect of you? Are you teaching like a, a class, like a high school class for how long you go abroad? Are you teaching it by yourself? It um, depends. Um, so some programs truly are teaching assistant programs. So there will be a primary teacher in the classroom and you will be there primarily for um, like con to practice conversation so that they can hear your American accent, quote unquote, um, and instead of the British, British English. Um, and you're there to share about your own culture, where you come from, um, things like that. Um, and that's the case with most of the Fulbright opportunities. Um, there are also Fulbright opportunities that place you in university settings where you might be working with um, students from the host country who are interested in studying in the United States, actually. So you might be talking to them more about the higher education system in the United States, things like that. Um, I know that, well, there are many opportunities to teach English in Asia, um, in like, for example, South Korea or in China. And I haven't done that myself, but I know from, um, you know, having spoken with people who have done so, that often in those cases you are actually the primary teacher and you have a lot more responsibility and you're going to be doing a lot more lesson planning. So I think it, it varies. Your level of responsibility definitely varies. Mm -hmm. How often are these teaching assistants paid? That probably depends on the program. I think monthly is usually what... Um, so they are paid? Yeah. They usually are, yeah, yeah, and the well, rate of pay also varies. So um, a lot of the placements in Western Europe, for example, um, they might provide a stipend, which is maybe just enough to get by a kind of modest student lifestyle. But then I mentioned the placements in Asia and South Korea and Japan, they pay a lot more. Um, so uh, enough that you might actually be able to save some money. So the rate of pay varies. But I would say that in general, people probably get paid monthly. I got paid monthly when I did the Fulbright. Um, ISIC? ISIC? Yeah, ISIC, yeah. Okay. yeah. Are those paid? They are supposed to be paid in some way, shape, or form. It might be in kind, like you might get free housing and board, um, but I think they are supposed to be paid. So. And also for the international fair, uh -huh. is that normal? No, no, I think you can come as you are. I'm actually a graduate student, and I thought your advice was really good, but Well, certainly, uh, it, one of the, I guess I can speak to this handout, the International uh, Career Pathway Series, um, several of those sessions, especially the more career-specific ones, are actually being put on by our graduate professional schools. So they are certainly applicable to graduate students. And then um, earlier in the 
the series, we had a graduate student strategies for finding international internships, which was focused on graduate students. Michelle actually led that. And the video, is it available on it's YouTube up, now? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I'm going to upload oh, it tomorrow. It so, will be on YouTube very soon. So this weekend, I would check for that yeah. video, and it's a, it's a good kind of background of um, various graduate students who um, were abroad last summer. So I think it'd be helpful for you. And one panel presentation I, I actually forgot to highlight, because it's actually brand new this year, it's the last one, which will take place on Tuesday, November 12th. It's actually all about language. And um, so it's language, a global advantage in international health and development work. So it's actually a, a perfect complement to this session. So if, if you're interested in those fields, please do attend. Um, that one is being sponsored by, I believe, the School of Public Health and the School of Nursing. So I would say that all of the remaining sessions would be applicable to graduate students. And as far as the other one, the language is your credential for a global career, um, I'm just scanning it right now and I think everything, pretty much everything on here would be uh, applicable to graduate students as well actually. Their internships with the State Department, Peace Corps, the fellowships that are listed. Yeah, a lot of this is actually applicable to graduate students too. And then also check with um, your graduate schools or your school's career office. Um, most of, I would say all the graduate schools either have their own maybe international center or at the very least a point person who is aware of these opportunities and can perhaps advise you more specifically. I'm actually a recent graduate. Is oh, cool. that, is like a lot of this also applicable to people that you know just graduated also or is a lot of this more geared towards just undergrads and more graduate students? Oh, the, like those panels or what, what were you like referring general, to? Like the events, like oh. recent graduates, is it also like? Yeah, I would say that any, all of these events coming up would also be applicable to, uh, to recent graduates if they're able to attend. And then the teaching opportunities that um, I've been talking about, those are definitely applicable to recent graduates. Yeah. I think the only ones, I think on this, the sheet language has a credential for a global career. I see State Department listed here. And the State Department internships that we often advise on, those do require that you're returning to an academic institution after the internship. So you'd ha have to be um, a returning student for those. All but the just the internship program. Yep, but certainly if you wanted to enter the Foreign Service, that's something we actually haven't even talked about, but yeah. that's certainly a global career uh, where you would be working in um, one of the U.S. embassies abroad or for the State Department in Washington, D.C. And if you are a student who is looking for a summer internship, um, the State Department does have an internship program, and we were supposed to have an information session on it, but unfortunately, because of the government shutdown, um, the diplomat in residence was unable to give the information session last night. Hoping to reschedule, um, ho hopefully the uh, shutdown will end soon, but um, the University of Michigan is really lucky to have a diplomat in residence on campus, and she's actually a career foreign service officer who is, has a residency or is posted here for um, one or two years. And so um, as, as a diplomat residents, she's here to not only tell people about opportunities with the State Department, but to also advise people individually. So uh, her name is Michelle Jones, and she is posted at the Ford School of Public Policy, but she is a resource for the entire University of Michigan community. So once the government shutdown ends, she will be uh, able to meet with people and hopefully give a presentation <coughs> about it. But um, she also, in addition to giving an information session on the State Department internships, um, she also gives information sessions on preparing for the Foreign Service exam. So in order to be part of the Foreign Service, you have to go through an application process, which includes an exam, and then there's an oral interview, and some other things. So she advises on that as well. So there's a lot of resources for that. I just had a question for Michelle. You, you referred earlier on to the importance of cultural understanding or cultural studies. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit to what you feel is valuable about that that might be in addition or distinct from language studies? I, th I think what was um, valuable in, in taking those types of classes was that coming into Peace Corps, um, I felt like I was more, I was, I was e it was easier to adapt in general. I guess it's the idea that some people who joined Peace Corps with me had never taken a cultural studies class, had never taken a language, and it was such a shock for them, and they sometimes just couldn't wrap their heads around certain cultural uh, norms in, in the country that we were in, that I definitely felt not so much that I was used to, but that I 
was well aware of the fact that like not everyone lives in a certain, like we live here in the U.S., that there are certain cultural things that are very different in other parts of the world, and I feel like cultural studies classes helps you prepare for things like that. shift gears a bit more to um, seeing maybe if there are specific questions that you have and doing some things online, but there was a hand up there. Yeah, I, I was just wondering um, if you guys could touch on what careers one could seek through interpretation or translation specifically. Well, I have to say that I'm personally not super familiar with that, but I did want to follow, because you asked that question too, um, as maybe another way to look into it. Um, you could look at those graduate institutes and maybe see where their graduates have been placed in the past. Usually, at least nowadays, it seems like a lot of graduate schools actually list like alumni information on their websites, and that might be a good idea to see where people are working. And I'm sure the Career Center might have some information about that, but I'm sorry, I unfortunately am not super familiar with that career path myself. Same. Certainly someone at the University of Michigan is familiar with it. Um, <laughs> possibly, or, what language do you study? I uh, study French and Russian. Okay. Um, I mean, starting with the faculty in your departments, um, they probably would know, possibly would know something about uh, careers in translation, and maybe they know of um, a alum from U of M who they had as students who maybe went on to become translators. Right. Because I'm interested in like coupling interpretation or translation with another career oh, instead okay. of working just as a translator. As oh, a career, okay. Oh, cool. So coupling that with something like working in an embassy or mm -hmm. um, within law, international law, but I haven't really found like an exact branch within a school to go to for that information. Yeah, I just unfortunately don't know off the top of my head. But you think seeking um, advice from our language instructors themselves? That would certainly be a good place to start. And then again, looking at uh, some of the programs that Kali mentioned and seeing where their students have ended up and what types of things that they've done. Useful. By show of hands, um, how many of you are first year students? Okay. Second year? Third year? And then there were some graduating students. Okay. So kind of the, the first, third, and fourth. Mm -hmm. So many sophomores. Okay. Um, so the juniors and seniors, you might be more familiar with some of the resources I want to touch on. Uh, and I think some of you are dressed up in suits, so maybe you went to the career fair um, and had interviews. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe we can address the question that you raised about translation and specific kinds of careers. I want to show you some resources. Um, and the reason that I, I have some uh, cards, uh, these are just um, for you to do some, grab a couple um, or some kind of piece of paper. And then towards the end, an optional thing, um, and this is just to encourage you to take next steps. So to take this information and to translate into something actionable. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so some of you early on might be at the point where you're kind of interested in language and culture. You have some ideas about things like you want to do, like you like doing, and you don't quite know how to make that connection. One thing that um, I would encourage all of you to log into and make use of um, is the Career Center. Some things you can just browse around, and so for someone right now uh, looking to see what have other students in LSA done, you can look to see. Uh, a sampling of majors. They're not um, this list. Oh, gosh, gosh. Who is an IT? She's Lizzie is an IT analyst. So this isn't uh, comprehensive, but it gives you a couple of data points. This is someone who double majored in Spanish and communications, and she is working at Cisco in information technology. So there, she had a set of transferable skills that made her attractive to this corporation. And it could be that her linguistic and her language abilities 
gave her um, a better understanding of communication within English. So these are just some ways to, to break down the content of what you're studying into sets of skills that any employer, any kind of graduate professional program would want to have. So the Career Center is one place where you can look to see if somebody's doing something similar to you. Um, career guides. This is a list of mostly LSA majors. And we already looked at German. Uh, let's look at um, and these are great resources if you're building your resume because at the top here it gives you skills and abilities so any major you have um, I'm hoping is equipping you and helping you to refine your skill set um, this list will be a little bit different depending on the major that you're picking if you're doing math in addition to having analytical skills you probably have more specific quantitative and technical skills or programming skills um, so there's some different sir, but these are great um, verbs, active verbs, and things that you can add to a potential resume that you're building. Um, and then at the bottom of the site are examples of what other program graduates have done. It's not exhaustive, but again, if you're early on thinking, what, how might I might make the next step? This is a great place just to get a sense of what's out there. So this person who studied in um, East, Russian Eastern European and Eurasian Studies, there's a subset here who did really broadly research skills working for a museum policy researcher so it, it's not necessarily strictly tied to understanding of Russia but a set of analytical skills that made them um, capable of, make, of making that next step uh, State Department area specialist so there that would be a person that I'm assuming their content knowledge within Russian Eastern European studies is what um, kind of led them to that particular career um, international affairs lawyer. So the little books mean that they need to get a graduate degree. You don't need to have any particular language proficiency um, to go into international affairs, but it might have given that person a better understanding of the culture and the society to actually make them a little bit more attuned, um, like Michelle was saying, to making that transition. Um, you know, personal cross-cultural skills, and then education, journalism. So this, again, is on the Career Center site. Uh, so this is another starting place, just to get some ideas, what have other students done? Now, if you find something in this list um, that appeals to you, you seem to find yourself in this list. If you go down to the bottom, you have the contact information for the department. They're like um, the German department, the Romance language department. They will have departmental resources. Um, you'll find different ways to get involved in using your language skills. So set up an appointment with the concentration or major advisor to learn about who's doing what. Um, some departments will have peer advisors. Most will have undergraduates um, organizations or groups. So there you can network with people with similar interests have bachelors. Uh, about a third have masters and 11% associates. So there you might see a pattern. It could be a career where experience is going to be the most significant. So you're thinking internships, volunteer organizations, um, ways to supplement my education. And it's going to be less tied to I have to have this kind of major. Um, other things will be you might, if you're looking at researcher, um, policy expert, it's going to say PhD. So you need to know economics to be working for the UN in their economic policy section. Um, for those of you who use other career center resources, you can do interest inventories and personality kinds of inventories just to get some other tools to think about what you gravitate towards. If you know what those are, you can use those codes to look for other positions that are coded as artistic and social. And that could be a way to see, well, I know that I have these particular qualities beyond translation. What else is out there that I think I would do well in? Um, and then related occupations. You can also look up employment and wage information to see how big a difference it makes state by state. And um, at the very bottom, some of these entries will link you to yet another Department of Labor website, Occupational Outlook Handbook. Any of you use the site? Okay. It's basically the same information, but it's filled in. It's more narrative. Same thing you can get um, median pay. So 43000 it's reasonable. Um, what they do, your work environment, pictures of them in action, how to become one, 
and similar occupations so that you can browse through things that are related, and then context for more information. This is where you see what's the community that actually does this work. So like NAFSA, you might find that organization. If you go to a, the website of a professional association, if it's a large enough association, oh, there's an American Translators Association. You might then be able to look at a job board. What do all the other translators um, do? There you go. Um, I'm looking to see, is there a job site? Careers. Okay. Some, some of these sites, you might need to um, set up an account. Others are going to be available to you. If you go to the Career Center site, the Career Center has subscriptions to some sites that um, have some kind of fee attached to it. So take advantage of the fact that you are currently a student. For those of you who are recent graduates, I'm not quite sure what kind of benefits extend to you, but it's worth contacting the Career Center as an alumni. Yes. I think that the Career Center benefits extend to you up to three years from your graduation. Okay. It's two to three years. Okay. Um, so this is a way, again, to look for things that you might want to do right after graduation. Or if you're thinking, this is definitely something I want to do, let me look at what a senior position requires and then work backwards. You might notice that you actually need to be proficient in three languages to get the kind of jobs you're interested in. <laughs> so you might think, okay, so along the way, I want to study additional languages. Um, there, what you'll find in any kind of job posting is um, qualifications. And there you might notice a pattern in certain industries, the credential, your degree matters a lot. You need to have this particular engineering degree to get this next position at an engineering firm. There are other positions that say, that's great, wonderful, have a bachelor's, but more importantly, have a set of skills. So even if you didn't extensively study a subject, but you can demonstrate and you can prove that you have those skills, that's going to be what's valuable at the next stage. So for those of you who are majoring or minoring in a language, if you cannot have the interview in that language that you're studying, that's really going to be um, the obstacle. It's not the fact that you have a degree, but that you have the skill set to leverage into the next step. Um, so learn the language that you're studying thoroughly and to an advanced level of proficiency. Because um, that you can take with you whatever you do, whether or not you do something that requires that language. Okay. Any questions about some of these sites? Now all these you can link off of the Career Center website. Um, what I also want to show you here is the International Career Pathways site. There are these two great links. Um, it's linked through Merlin. It's a it's a um, subscription that that you would have access to. And I did a search earlier. Um, where I want to find find a job. So I said. Language documents. That's a steady job, I think. <laughs> um, or you could be a freelance translator. So, this is just a way of seeing okay, so pick some targets and play around with some possibilities. And um, once you find that, look to see for this teaching position at London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, maybe you do need a certain kind of credential through the UK education system. Or it could be you are a native English speaker and you have these cultural and linguistic abilities to share. So this is the global, global glo going global. global. Going yeah. global. Um, the other, oops, oops, right. here. One thing, if I can quickly jump yes. in there, um, those job listings are, are really awesome and a great way to see what's out there, but just keep in mind that um, in order to work in a foreign country, you would need work authorization. And sometimes that can be extremely difficult to get. So just keep that in mind. So um, it, you'd probably have to look further into those positions to see whether that would come with work authorization or if they're only looking to hire people who are already authorized to work in that country. So. Oh. Okay. And the Going Global website is also really useful if you um, 
have one country in particular that you are looking into. Uh, they have a bunch of country career guides, and so you can look at like job search websites in various countries, and they have examples of, of resumes and um, cover letters and things like that. Useful resources to learn more about how other people made that next step, personal stories, and job boards as well. So right now, especially if you're early on, these um, won't be the thing that you're doing right after you graduate, but at least it, it helps you prepare for how do you put yourself in a pathway where you can potentially gather those skill sets. Um, for those of you who are towards the end and actually in that job search area, um, one thing that I think all graduates need more practice on is to be able to articulate and identify really clearly to a prospective employer what it is that you know and can do. Okay. Um, so, as a quick exercise, take 10 seconds, think about something um, you are learning in a classroom. It doesn't have to be your major or your minor, just something, a subject that you're learning. Think about a skill that it requires you to use, okay? And find a neighbor and present your argument as to what it is you think you're good at and an example academically that demonstrates this. So it could be you're a great communicator. You gave a presentation in a class about a very complicated subject the other day and people seem to understand and enjoy it. Okay, so real quick, think about it for a sec, and then chat. So, yes, I'm a minor in Asian languages and cultures, so my main language is Mandarin Chinese, but I'm taking Tibetan. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you a part of it? Um, I can get around and carry a conversation pretty easily. So yeah, I would say I've achieved at least in a week. Okay, swap. So if you haven't swap yet. Yeah. So what language are you using? I'm just Russian. And Hebrew. Yes. But the thing is that I don't know. Wait, so what do I want to do? Yeah, what's your class? What's your class? So, the thing I had was a job position. Yeah, I'm a music major. I'm a music I also do music. Oh, cool. Um, well, there are two options for the music major and the LSA. I'm an example of that. I've done a lot of things. You don't have to do that. But anyway, so composition um, definitely requires creativity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It requires creativity. Okay. All right. So what you're doing? Partly, you're practicing your 30-second elevator speech when you have a little bit of somebody's time and you want to grab their attention. The other thing is you're also practicing for interviews. Many interviews are behavioral interviews. They want to know, is there an example we've encountered this in the past? Tell us what you did. So the more specific, and it's basically a paper that you're presenting. You're picking a uh, claim that you're making and having evidence to show it up to say, here's how I did that. Um, is anybody going to share an example that they shared in their little group? Anybody? If not, Kelly. Kelly has one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just short and sweet. So to say, um, um, my skill is, I guess, communication skills and public presentation skills, and I've exercised this by giving presentations all the time for work. So. I've um, developed skills with public speaking and representation by working as um, an intern translating for uh, pieces with lawyers who can't speak and represent their clients and judges as well. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So, there, you were generating a skill set that you identified in yourself. Here is a website, um, National, National Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, so you can find these on the Career Center sites as well. Here are some skills that employers ask for, they're looking for, kind of their top 10. Ability to work in a team structure, 
uh, decision making, problem solving, planning, organizing, prioritizing, and so on. So these are some skills that sets that will commonly come up in terms of job descriptions and qualifications. And that's also what you're, the story that you're sharing in, in your interview or your personal statement. So you can also look to see what organization do I want to be a part of. Um, so it could be for applying to medical schools, the American Medical Association and the Association of Medical Colleges has a list of personal and um, professional competencies that they're looking for, um, varying from ethical behavior, communication skills, and personal skills. So you can look to see what's prized in the community that you want to step into, and then work backwards. Think about, do I have these skills? Can I prove that I have these skills? And it, it can also help identify for you, perhaps it's something that you need to take a class on or get more experience on. So um, your ability, so in this case, technical knowledge related to the job will be specific to the job. Analyzing quantitative data. It might not be the key thing that you're doing as a translator, but it could be something that sets you apart or gives you the flexibility to be generating analysis of the productivity of your organization in a quantitative way that will, again, give you some more opportunities. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, the other thing, uh, idealist.org, anybody know of the site? They're coming to Ann Arbor on the 3rd, tomorrow, they have a grad school fair. This information is linked off of the Career Center site, so you can get a lot of the stuff from there. Um, multilingual candidates will have an advantage. English, German, French, Spanish, Dutch. And I looked this up. It's um, what people speak in Madagascar. Yeah. So there, you might not be interested in working overseas necessarily, but if you do a search on some kind of site like this, um, where you know that your language skills, um, so here I'm thinking within job, and I want to say in a region like Los Angeles, where you have a very multicultural, very multilingual um, community, where um, you can be a community organizer or working for a resource center, a campus or a shelter program, an advocate. Um, so again, these are some ways to think less about the entire thing as a package, but to pull out the specific skill sets that you have, and then to practice how you articulate that you have these skill sets. The articulation piece is so important. I remember um, over the summer I had a conversation with a friend and colleague who works at the Career Center, and she said that you know, they often see U of M students with their A-plus resumes who are having trouble with interviews because they don't know how to articulate it. So it is really, really important. So the, it's really wide open what you can do. This kind of presentation, a lot of the general things would be applicable, you know, so you're an English major, what are you gonna do with that? Again, it's your skill sets. Um, these kinds of resources will, um, especially the handout that you have um, from Kelly, are looking internationally where your language skill might not be a bonus, it could be an expectation. Um, so there, there are gonna be different things that come up. Um, other websites that you can link into, anything that has to do with State Department, USA Jobs, is the federal government's um, job database. And there you can um, be a language instructor um, for, the Defense Department. Um, there are languages that the Defense uh, Department uh, considers critical languages. So there are ways in which you can get financial support to study languages that the government feels we need more people who can speak this language because it's, it's a national security issue. So there are also some ways where you can find funding and um, you're actually going to be in the minority and therefore incredibly desirable to certain kinds of employers. 
Um, so lastly, um, the one other exercise, and this is optional. So those little um, index cards I passed around, um, oh, this, this part I'm going to encourage you to do. The other part is optional. So if you can take a moment and write down uh, a question that you have, a goal that you have, like something that you feel you, you need a little bit more information about, and something that you think you can do to actually get closer to that. Um, the goal can be really big. I want to figure out my life. Um, but then what I want you to think about is what's one step that will help you get closer to that? So an example could be I'm going to go to the next panel discussion to learn more about public health careers. Or I'm going to stop by my academic advisor's office in the German department, in the Russian department, to find out what have other graduates done recently. Or go to any of these websites and play around with some of the opportunities. Um, so write that down. And the optional part is for any of you who, um, for whom it helps to have a little bit more of a scaffold, um, write down your email address and I will follow up with you in two weeks to see whether you've done it. If not, if there's something that will help you get that one step closer to what your long-term plan is. Um, so you don't have to do that. If you feel you can, you can do it on your own, you can just take that card with you. Um, but for those of you who feel you can met, benefit from a nudge, it won't be scolding. It's just a reminder. Um, I'm happy to follow up and just see where you're at or suggest a resource um, if you're interested. Okay. And if you want that, just leave the card at the table and I'll gather them at the end. Are there any sort of closing remarks that you'd like to make? Um, I did just want to remind those of you who are still here, if you could fill out your evaluation forms, that would be fantastic. We do this presentation every year and we're happy to hear your feedback of how you think we could improve, what other resources you would like to have us present. So please do that before you leave. Um, and if anyone has any questions about Peace Corps, I'd be happy to talk to you guys. I can give you my email. If you think of anything, uh, feel free to email me. So. And I should also say that if you um, want to come in to talk more about global opportunities, uh, the International Center is always open, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, and we're happy to chat with you. Thank you so much for coming out.